8.30 p.m. on the day of the board meeting will be read during the meeting. And I'd like to invite Heidi Marty to read this read our board mission this evening or a district okay. mission. Okay, thanks Regina. The mission of Intermediate District 287 is to be the premier provider of innovative specialized services to ensure that each member district can meet the unique learning needs of its students. Thank you, Heidi. Uh -huh. And now we'll have board member introductions. And Crystal, could you please uh, call each board member in alphabetical order so that we can introduce ourselves and our member districts? Adams. Steve Adams from Hopkins School District 270. And I am Crystal Brackey from Richfield Public Schools. Casey. Ann Casey, St. Louis Park. Keen. Hi, Andrea Keen, representing Wyzetta Public Schools. Dallas. Hi, Ruthie Dallas from Brooklyn Center Community Schools, number 286. Douglas. Hi, Heather Douglas with Osseo Area Schools, District 279. Kuntz. Hi, Michelle Kuntz representing Orono. Marty. Hi, Heidi Marty from Mount West Tonka Schools, District 277. Neville. Hi, I'm Regina Neville with the Dinah Public Schools, District 273. Sant. Sam Sant, uh, Robbinsdale, District 281. And Seidel. Sorry, I always forget the different keyboard shortcut to unmute between the two computers. Uh, Adam Seidel, Eden Prairie 272. Thank you, welcome everyone. I'd also like to welcome the staff members who are with us this evening. We have Ann Becker, Sean Garvey, May Hawkins, Kim Helgeson, Rachel Hicks, Sandy Lewandowski, Ben McGross, Chad Maxa, Juanine M. Jeannie, Elizabeth Lodge Rogers, and Sarah Schreifels. Is there anyone who I have inadvertently missed from the staff who has joined us this evening? Welcome, glad to have everybody here. Um, we'll walk through this evening's agenda. Uh, following audience opportunity to speak, we'll have approval of the consent agenda. And then we will have share the success and recognition with the most timely um, 2020 retiree videos so we can celebrate those who have given many years of service to the district. We have a business services and labor relations report and also a policy review this evening under board business, annual organizational membership renewal, uh, superintendent evaluation summary of the evaluation that was completed at the last board meeting, a review of board communication guidelines, and an AMSD report. Are there any additions to the agenda? Hearing none, I move that we accept the agenda as printed. Is there a second? Second, Michelle Kuntz, Orono. Thank you, Michelle. And uh, Crystal, would you please call the roll to accept the agenda? Adams. Aye. Bracky is a yes. Casey. Aye. King. Yes. Dallas. Yes. Douglas. Yes. 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 Are other people hearing that feedback? No. Yeah. I'm wondering if someone has the meeting launched on two separate devices. There we go. Problem solved. Uh, Douglas, I saw your hand raised, but we'll let you say it out loud too. Now it looks like Heather may be frozen. There she is. I said, I said uh, yes. Great. Thank you. Sorry about that. Coons. Aye. Marty. Aye. Neville. Yes. Sant. Yes. Seidel. Yes. Okay, thank you. The agenda is approved. And Juanine, is there anyone who has requested to address the board this evening through audience opportunity to speak? No, Madam Chair. 
Thank you. Uh, next up is the con consent agenda. Is there any item on the consent agenda anyone would like removed for separate consideration? Hearing none, is there a motion to accept the consent agenda as printed? I so move, Andrea. Oh. I, moved by, I will second. Moved by Andrea and seconded by Steve. Thank you. Crystal, would you please call the roll? Adams. Aye. Bracky is aye. Casey. Aye. Keen. Yes. Dallas. Yes. Douglas. Yes. Thank you. Coons. Aye. Marty. Yes. Neville. Yes. Sam. Yes. Seidel. Yes. Thank you. The consent agenda is approved as written. Next, we will have our 2020 retiree video. And uh, in most years, we are able to have a celebration that all of us can attend so that we can thank our staff members for their service in person. But given that that was not an opportunity this year, at minimum, I want to just express the gratitude of the board for all of our staff who've given commendable service to the district and to our students. Rachel, could you please give a little introduction for our video? Yes. Um, so uh, we've had uh, 19 retirees um, happen in the 1920 school year. So this video is just a special recognition to acknowledge um, all the time and um, love and compassion and work that they've put into our students and our district. Um, and we usually do have an event, um, as Regina noted, in May that our board usually attends. And um, we did survey our retirees this year, and um, it was uh, their preference that we do a special care package, retiree care package. Um, so that will be getting to them this summer. Um, so we'll go ahead and take a look at this video. Um, Chad, take it away. All right. I'm really sorry about that. It's just, it's too choppy, this thing, the way we would expect it to. So um, we're just gonna have to share the link out. 
I apologize for that. No, it's thank really you. hard I to know that it's show a, lot a video to while we're streaming. It is, yeah. But is it possible to post the video um, along with the the meeting minutes so that people can access it separately? Yes, certainly. We and we will do that. Yeah, I, I apologize. Fantastic. It's just not going to work. I understand. And the link is the link is attached in both boardwalk packets. Yes. So if you click on it, you can see it, the video as well. Excellent. So we have a couple of opportunities and the community will be able to see it through the website. So thank you. Uh, does anyone have any other comments regarding our retirees before we move on? Okay, we're going to follow with um, item eight on the agenda, the business services and labor relations report. The first item up with the financial report is the food services year in review. This is an information item. And May. Um, Chair Neville, can I ask a pardon? question? Is, has number six, the superintendent's report, been removed from the agenda? Oops, that is my mistake. No, it is here and I flipped ahead on board book premiere. Thank you very much. Here it is. Thank you. So superintendent's report, Sandy, welcome. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, and actually this is pretty short. I did want to just alert the board that not unlike uh, many of your districts, we are delving into uh, options for fall in terms of distance learning, hybrid uh, learning, or face-to-face. -face. Uh, per the, the Commissioner of Education, we're to uh, develop three different scenarios, and they will help direct us uh, near the end of July. So we've convened a task force, if you will, uh, representing many, many parts of the district. Chad is leading that effort. Uh, they are, are beginning to meet on a regular basis. And we hope to have a more full report for you on that uh, later in the last board meeting in, in June. But I did wanna alert you that we have already started that process and are considering all the many things we have to consider for fall. And happy to answer any questions about that if, if anyone has any. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions um, for Superintendent Lewandowski? I don't see any hands raised on board book premiere um, and I don't see anyone flagging on the video. So thank you, Sandy, I appreciate it. And with that, we will move on to item eight, the business services and labor relations report and the food services year in review. And May, welcome. So I'm just going to quickly introduce our food services supervisor, Sarah Streifels, and Sarah is going to present uh, the food services year in review. Thank you, May, and welcome, Sarah. Thank you. I'm just sharing my screen here. Okay, well, good evening. I am Sarah Streifels, food service manager for the district. I am happy to be here virtually with you tonight to share some of food services work over this past year. Although our year was cut short, you will see that we were able to pack in a lot of fun and nutrition and the time that we did have with students on site. The food service team was happy to see an increase in meal counts this school year. Overall, meal participation was up at all sites. We saw an increase of 4,000 meals at both breakfast and lunch between September and February of this school year. The special events and student involvement likely had an impact on this increase. Food service is committed to their role in student involvement and good nutrition to support positive student outcomes. Lead cook, uh, Cheryl Johnson, joined our food service team this year and assisted with developing some new recipes the barbecue chicken flatbread and turkey and Swiss panini sandwiches, both pictured here, were big hits, as well as cheesy potato and tomato bisque soups that we featured this winter. Many of our new recipes were featured in social media posts, and we received very positive comments from parents, students, and staff about all of the new food options. 
Taste testings that were conducted at sites during lunch helped us determine winning recipes and got the students involved in the menu planning process. Pictured here is one of the taste testings we did at North Education Center in December. Students voted thumbs up or down using stickers. Many of the taste tested items ended up on our winter menus. Students were constantly asking us when the next taste testings would be. And through this process, we even got them to try new foods like honey roasted chickpeas and chocolate hummus. Because of course you can get kids to eat vegetables if you turn them into chocolate, right? <laughs> Uh, my favorite part of this job is the student interaction and fun events I get to plan with and for our students. This year, each site student council had the opportunity to plan a special lunch and breakfast event at their site with me. The student councils had the student body vote on menu options selected by the councils. On top of the student council planned events, we also had some fun, um, some fun hot cocoa and breakfast banana split events at the sites. Of course, all foods met regulations and the banana splits at breakfast were made from yogurt, not ice cream. Um, since I have limited food service staff, uh, it takes the help of many to pull off some of these events. As you can see from some of the photos, site and district leaders are always willing to help and we so greatly appreciate their support. Sandy, our superintendent, even got in on the action this year at North Education Center, handing out fudge bars at their special lunch. I also wanted to give district service staff opportunities to interact with our students so they could see who they are working for each day. I asked for volunteers to help serve banana splits and hot cocoa and had an overwhelming response from so many departments. Those who volunteered were excited to have had the opportunity and one employee from HR said banana split day was their favorite new day of the year. The students love to see new faces in the cafeteria line and staff get the opportunity to interact with the students that they serve. National School Breakfast Week was also celebrated at our sites the first week of March. The theme was school breakfast out of this world. Each site student council selected a special breakfast menu to serve that week. And we even offered a crazy donut day making whole grain donuts with all kinds of crazy but compliant toppings. I would say the s'mores donuts pictured were by far the biggest it. Food service also hosted an art and coloring contest for students with prizes. Uh, student art entries were displayed in the cafeterias and it was fun to see how proud the students were of their works of art, showing them off to all their friends and teachers. Another project I had the opportunity to be a part of this year was the startup of a student led food shelf at South Education Center. This project was in collaboration with Veep, who donates the Shelf Stable Food Weekly and our South Education Center Student Work Program. Two of the student workers, Sienna and Anna, are pictured here working at the food shelf. To prevent the need for additional food licenses, a small space was set aside in the kitchen for these students to utilize as the food shelf. They had over 118 visits to the food shelf by South Education students in the month of February. Food shelves at other sites are being considered, uh, but do require us to find partnering organizations who will donate the shelf stable food items. To ensure the food service department is aligned with district priorities, racial equity, trauma, PBIS, and USDA regulatory trainings were provided to food service staff this year. Employee wellness resources were also highlighted several times throughout the year. The trauma training was new to my staff this year and I think ended up being the most helpful. It really opened their eyes to the needs of our students and I had many positive comments coming from principals at the end of the year about how they had witnessed food service staff building positive relationships with students. Apply Now, an online meal application system, was implemented this school year. Use of the system has been slow, although we did receive 16 additional online applications during distance learning. We will continue with the program and do some additional marketing to help increase its use. It will become even more beneficial if any distance learning activities continue into next year. We did end the year with just over $15,000 in meal debt. We were able to fundraise just over $13,000 to help cover some of this debt through an $8,000 donation from the Philando Castile Foundation mm -hmm. and a Give Minnesota campaign. 
Utilizing our district application of fundraise or donated funds process, we were able to pay off just over half of the debt. Due to COVID-19 and the financial stress of our families, the remaining paid student debt is being written off at the end of the year. All negative accounts have been reset back to zero for fall. Remaining donated funds will be carried over for use next year. During distance learning, our food service staff did provide free meals to youth age 18 and under for the first three weeks. Participation was very slow and vendor minimum order requirements made it impossible to continue to provide. A Google Doc was created and shared with social workers uh, that contained information on all of our member districts meal plans so they could direct families to their resident district programs. Social workers reported families in need of food to the district and food donations from Sheridan Story and Beep were routed by bus every other week to these about 100 families. Food service staff assisted in the organizing and preparing of these shipments. Staff also started janitorial roles in each of the buildings at the beginning of April, doing deep cleaning and sanitizing projects. Budget effects of COVID-19 on the food service department were kept as minimal as possible. Our projected loss of revenue from meal claims is around $98,000, and our operating budget savings are around $86,000 giving us a total loss of around 12,000. The loss may end up coming in less than that as we finalize budgets at the end of the year, especially with the cancellation of summer food service with distance learning continuing into the summer. Planning has begun for the 2021 school year, specifically with COVID-19 in mind. I am participating in the district back to school work group to help determine what return to school in the fall might look like. Food service options are being considered for both in-person and distance learning models. Meetings with each site principal will be scheduled this summer to determine best plans to meet each site's food service needs, as one plan may not work for all. I am also participating in a School Nutrition Association Back to School training, which is providing guidance on best practices in food service in response to COVID-19. We are still awaiting specific direction from USDA on what waivers and programs will be available to utilize next school year as current waivers expire August 30th. Vendors are already warning us of possible supply shortages and food price increases. Fall menus have already been submitted to our vendor to assist them with preventing outages as much as possible. It will be an interesting year, but I'm looking forward to the challenge and have a great food service team to work with. We are ready to step up to this challenge um, with me. In light of all of the challenges we might encounter, I still like to find some positives. And with the possibility of students um, eating in classrooms, we may have a captive audience that will give us more opportunity to promote health and district wellness initiatives and farm to school activities that we weren't able to provide in a cafeteria setting, giving us opportunities, of course, to expand on our district wellness policy. Along with the challenges of COVID-19, we have also learned that the 2018 rollbacks of school nutrition regulations were struck down. These rollbacks allowed schools to provide some non-whole grain items, halt additional sodium restrictions um, that are expected to be implemented in coming years, and offer a wider variety of milk options. Schools for now will need to re-implement the original 2013 Health and Hunger-Free Act regulations back into their menus. USDA continues to work to find leniencies as they are able. We just learned recently that we were awarded a $25,000 USDA equipment grant to replace the 30-year-old dish machine at Ann Bremer Education Center. Installation of the new machine will occur this summer, along with other kitchen construction that's already occurring at that site. So thank you for having me as a part of your meeting tonight. I thoroughly enjoy coming each year to give my report. It is my honor to be working for the district and serving our students. If you have any questions, I would be happy to take those now. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's just a fantastic, whoops, am I? No, I'm not muted, good. It's just a fantastic presentation and it's just always so much to learn. I see that um, Andrea has requested has a question 
followed by Crystal. So Andrea, go ahead, please. Thank you so much, Sarah. This is Andrea Keene from YZ. Um, I want to thank you for that presentation and your work. Um, I wanted to start off by saying how impressed I am by ever since you've been at 287, you really welcome student voice. And I think that it's really reaped a lot of benefits. We can see that participation keeps going up and it just looks like so many of the activities that you do are so fun. Um, so thanks for doing that. And, and then you just had to face all sorts of challenges that <laughs> nobody was prepared for. And I'm just really impressed by how you've done that. So thank you. I have one quick question. Um, we've had the opportunity to learn in past years about the great use of the 287 gardens. And um, I'm just wondering, are the gardens doing anything this year or are they having a rest year? <laughs> um, the gardens were doing some things at West Education Center until COVID-19 kind of struck. Mm -hmm. So that's normally their planting time. So since um, you know they weren't able to plant in kind of early mid-April that they normally would, I don't believe the gardens are growing quite this year. But we did um, have some garden use this fall. Um, I know at West Education Center, they had some um, baked potatoes that we were able to add to a lunch menu. Um, so things that they weren't able to utilize in their summer program that held well, um, they did offer to us for use in the fall. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, next up will be Crystal Brecky and then followed by Steve Adams. So Crystal. Yeah, I just want to echo the first thing that Andrea said. It was a great presentation. It was really helpful, and I think it hit on all of the right points. So kudos to you for that. Um, my question is really specific, which is um, for this approximately $7,500 that we chose to write off in meal debt at the end of the year for families, um, what fund is that coming from? That's probably a better question for May. <laughs> That doesn't surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> so Crystal, that will be included in the transfer. Um, so as board members, many board members know, the food service fund is not self-sufficient at District 287. Um, it does take a transfer from the general fund to support our food services fund. And so that $7,500 will be part of that transfer. And May, do you roughly know what that total amount from the general fund to cover food costs is for this school year? That's a challenging question. Can I like look that up? Because I don't have it at the top of my head. No, I think it's around 400,000. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, next up, Steve Adams. Steve, Yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you. And yes, great job you did this year, Sarah. Um, I'm just curious, what's a dish machine? Is it a dishwashing? Yeah. Machine or, okay. Yeah, it's a dishwasher. Okay. I saw that we got that grant money, and um, that's great. But um, yeah, um, it's actually really nice because a lot of our student workers um, do some of the dishwashing at Ann Bremer Education Center. And so when the dish machine is out at times, the student workers don't have as great of an opportunity to assist us. So it'll be nice to have a reliable machine. Um, to help with yeah. the student work program as well. Well, good. All right. Thank you. Okay. Next, um, Heather Douglas. Thank you. So, um, May, I had a question for you. Um, I was wondering about the same thing that Crystal was asking about, is that, that money that we chose to write off, um, and I also saw that we had a net loss is that $7,500-ish amount included in that net loss or are those two separate figures? Those are two separate figures. So does that, are you saying that the net loss would be closer to 20,000? That'd be correct. Okay. okay. And by the way, I found, I found the notes from the revised budget. So the, the food service transfer is estimated at 440,000 440, at revised budget. Thank you. Are there any other, oh, Sandy, go ahead, please. And you're on mute. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, we may be shifting into May's report, but May, can can you just um, uh, 
briefly identify why our district has such a substantial loss uh, based on the size of our district, just for new board members, could they have that perspective, please? Um, certainly. So our food service department, due to the size of our buildings, um, operates at a loss. Because we don't have, um, you know, a thousand student high school um, and a ton of, um, I can't remember what that's called now. A la carte, thank you. <laughs> Brain's actually working. Um, a la carte sales and things like that that normally support a, a food services program, but yet we still need to have the same amount of cook hours to serve and things like that. So we have less revenue with the same about, amount of, of expenses. So we do reduce the expenses as far as we can, but there there is a certain level that you have to have of food and staff, um, right? And we, there's just not enough students at our site to offset those costs. That's helpful background. Mm -hmm. And Sandy, anything else that you wanted to share on this topic? No. Well, we'll be on the topic for a bit, but. No, thank okay. you. And I don't see any other raised hands. Were there any other questions before we move on to the annual food service program resolution? Okay, Sarah, thank you once again. It's just yeah, always welcome. a pleasure thank to you. have the update. Um, it's it's really nuanced and I love the voting. I just love the voting. <laughs> and I think I would love banana split day too. Cool. <laughs> thank so you. we will move on with 8.2.2, .2, the annual food service program resolution. And May, can you provide a little background and introduction, please? Sure. So this is a resolution that I bring to the school board every year about this time. Um, it allows the district, it's per USDA regulations, it allows the districts to offer a food service program for the upcoming school year. Um, in this particular resolution, it also includes the price of the meals. I will tell you that the price of the meals have not, has not changed except for the contracted uh, lunch. Um, and that's because the uh, state of Minnesota has stated that if we purchase lunches from another school district, the minimum amount they can, they can charge us is $3.85. So that is the amount that's listed in here is not to exceed $3.85 for any okay. meals that are purchased from a, a, a vendor. So other than that, there is no change in meal prices and um, it's the same resolution that the board saw last year to authorize a food service program. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the annual food service program resolution? So moved. Second. Thank you. Moved. Is that, was that moved by Sam? Yes. Thank you. And seconded by Steve. Thank you. Right. Is there any discussion? And I don't see any raised hands. So hearing no discussion, Crystal, would you please call the roll? Adams. Aye. Bracky is an aye. Casey. Aye. Keen. Yes. Dallas. Yes. Douglas. Yes. Thank you. Coons. Aye. Marty. Yes. Neville. Yes. Sam. Yes. Seidel. Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. We will move on to 8.2.3, liability and workers' compensation insurance renewal. Is there a motion to bring this to the table? This is Andrea. I so move. Thank you, Andrea. Is there seconded, a second? Seconded by Heidi Marty. Thank you. Moved by Andrea, seconded by Heidi. And um, May, could you please give us a little background on this item? Um, certainly. Normally, this item would be on the consent agenda um, because the annual re insurance renewal would be just a regular operational item. However, there is a substantial increase, as I put in the note in the board packet, in our workers' comp insurance. And so I felt it was. Um, prudent to bring it as an action item in case the board had questions or wanted additional information. Um, I did put quite a bit in the background in your item, but basically the district continues to see um, an increase in the amount of claims and injuries related to workers' comp. 
Um, and so our, I'm sorry, I seem to have a lot of lens there. You, I don't know that you can see me. Um, uh, so that our workers' comp premium has now exceeded uh, $1 million. Um, so if there are any uh, additional questions, I'd be happy to entertain those at this time. Thank you, May. And I see Andrea has a question. Go ahead, please, Andrea. I do. Thanks, May. Um, I really appreciated the background information in the board book. I'm wondering if you could help me understand what um, what MOD is, M-O-D? Sure. So a MOD is, is a term they use in um, workers' comp, but it's basically a rate setting. And so what they do is they use three years worth of your claims information, three closed years. Um, so uh, the last year in ours for this last is 1819. So it'd be um, 1819. I don't know that I can do the math backwards. 1819, 17, 18, 16, 17, um, right? So they take the claims from those years um, and and look at how, how are you trending, right? And we're trending up drastically. Um, and then they, they put all that together in a calculation to come up with what they refer to as a mod rate. Now that rate is basically what it does is it compares you to an average district, mm -hmm. right? So each industry has its own mod, right? So, and we're a school district. So in comparison to other school districts, our mod is 2.87 higher, right? So our claims are 2.87 higher than um, other school districts. So you can think of it as like 287%. Does that That's help? That's really helpful. Yep, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, the next people with questions or comments will be Ann Casey, followed by Steve Adams, and then Sam Sant. So Ann, go ahead, please. Thanks, May. Um, we heard at our board meeting in St. Louis Park this week that we were, our whole group was facing a large increase, bigger than this one, um, in our liability premium specific to COVID. Um, and I was curious if we had, if you were hearing anything like that from our provider or if that um, is not something that we've heard. Okay, so in the liability, as you saw, that's a 13.7% increase. The liability is a firm market, and um, our agents have told us that probably for the following year, in 2022, we will probably be looking at like a 20 or 25% increase in the liability market. Okay, thank you. Okay, Steve Adams. Yes, thank you, Chair Neville. Uh, Having been in the insurance business, I can tell you, Andrea, mod is modification, so okay. just shorthand. Uh, <laughs> but I was also curious, uh, none of the insurance uh, carriers are mentioned in this in this report. Do we have a single carrier for all of these coverages, or do we have separate uh, ones? I'm terribly sorry. No, we do not have a single carrier. Um, our liability insurance coverage is with Hanover. And our workers' health insurance covered is coverages with United Heartland. Okay, and I imagine we shop around for rates. We did year. shop around. Um, I don't know that we did on the liability. Uh, we probably will for next year on the workers' comp insurance when our current carrier came back so high. We did go yeah. to the market, um, and we did get quotes from a couple other carriers, but they were actually higher than continuing with our existing carrier. All right, very good, thank you. And Sam Sand. Thank you, um, my question is for uh, Ms. Hawkins or for the superintendent. Um, I know I'm, I'm new to the to this district and um, I know that the type of children that we, uh, that are educated at, at uh, 287 are trauma one level students and uh, I am aware that the liabilities would be high. Are there any, uh, Actions that we can take, you know, going in, into the future to try to re reduce those those claims, and if so, have any been done, or what what has the administration been looking at to try to re reduce those risks and claims? Okay, so I'll take that because um, I think I've included some of that in the background information. But um, the district did look at and do a kind of a data study to figure out, if, you know, is there a certain group? 
Um, is there some areas that we can focus on? And in our data study, we did find that there was a higher uh, injury and concussion rate in our new hires, right? So we did implement um, some uh, additional new hire training uh, that has occurred with staff for them to uh, be better at intervening without getting injured, um, put it that way, um, uh, before they even go to the classroom. And we are pretty firm now that the staff have to have that, that training before they can go to a school. So um, that was one thing that we did, that we just started that this fall, so we don't know what the outcome of that training is. Yet, right? Because we haven't closed this 1920 school year yet. Um, and then also, we did implement a lot of personal protection equipment, um, including a, a, a hat that's referred to as a beanie that uh, is used in the Navy, um, that is basically kind of a hard hat inside of a stocking cap sort of thing. Um, and then um, in some of our rooms, you couldn't, you couldn't go in without that personal protective equipment. And does that give a little bit of helpful background, Sam? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, May. May Sandy, would you like to add uh, anything? Yes, please. I'd just like mm -hmm. to add that um, I think the increase in the mod rate is consistent with reports that we've shared with the board about the increasing needs we're seeing of kids and unmet mental health and trauma needs. And uh, what we anticipate will continue in, in those needs going higher and higher as uh, mental health and trauma needs go unattended. So what we're doing in terms of trauma is, is expanding our knowledge and our, our understanding of the impact on trauma uh, that we think will help impact that. But we also um, know that when kids get better mental health services that are well matched, uh, we see some of those behaviors go, gone, uh, going down. And I would cite the TTM program, the therapeutic teaching program, where we have the intensive um, mental health support in there. Uh, the injuries to staff, I don't have the exact figures in front of me, but they dropped from pre-TTM years. And so we know uh, from that study and just our general knowledge, if kids' needs are being met, they're un less likely to be uh, communicating through behavior uh, than, than when their needs are being met. So uh, what I see, and, and again, you, you've heard uh, this from us before, mental health is a critical fa unmet factor for many of our kids and we need to continue to look for ways to uh, provide that mental health and I believe the the only place they're going to likely get that is in school so that's a new challenge for for schools and it's a particularly heightened in when you serve the population of students we serve in district 287. Thank you that is helpful background Andrea yeah, thank you, Sandy. You made me think of another question. Um, I'm just wondering if the change that we made three years ago when we took the school resource officers out of our buildings and replaced them with um, safety coaches, I'm remembering that that seemed to have a really positive impact on, um, on staff injuries. Did that help with any of this liability um, insurance issue or the workers comp, or was it not enough of an impact to affect those numbers? I don't necessarily think I can answer that with data, <laughs> to, un unfortunately. Uh, but what what um, I think we see is that our, our school uh, safety coaches are, are really skilled at de-escalating behavior and not letting it build up to the point where uh, we previously had to have police intervention. And so I would speculate, although I don't have data here tonight, that, that that's um, a factor that is helping us uh, by having the school safety coaches. Okay. Thank Madam you. Chair, I can speak to that if you like. Thank you, Ann. Um, go ahead. I happen to just look through the, the data from the pre-student safety coach era when we had SROs and then the post-student safety coach era. And it's clear that restrictive procedures for students have gone down since we uh, adopted the student safety coach model. And that's often uh, a place where staff get injured. 
is when they're doing restrictive procedures. Thank you. That is helpful okay. background. And I have a question. Uh, I understand that the insurance carriers are going to compare us to other school districts because this is education and it may look the same from their method of putting together a rating scale. But do we have any idea of how our injuries compare to the other intermediates? It's a small number of groups, a small number of intermediates, but are we in line with the other yeah. state intermediates? So yes, um, I, I, I'm pretty sure I included that in the background too. I'm just referencing it so that, um, yes, we are very similar to both 916 and 917 um, mod rate. So their mod rate and ours are very similar. Uh, 288 is a much newer intermediate district and so has a lower mod rate still at this time. Okay. Thank you. That is, um, it's all helpful background. I don't see any additional raised hands. Are there inter any other questions or comments before we move for approval of this item? All right, hearing um, none. Uh, this is Crystal, crazy. would you please? I was really? going to, uh, Go ahead, please. Just thinking back about the budget that was presented earlier. Uh, can all any of these issues impact the increase in funds to the district as far as showing the reduction in incidents and the mental health needs and all of that? I'm just curious why we are always running a deficit in the overall budget. Okay, I'm a little con the budget we were talking about earlier was the just the food services program. Yeah, the food services. This would not have any. Um, this doesn't deal with the liability insurance or anything. But just wondering, how could we get more dollars into the overall food budget where it's not showing a loss? Uh, is that, okay. I don't know if that is, so your question, Ruthie, is about the the previous item on food services and not specifically for the liability and workers' right. comp insurance. Okay. Right. And Sandy, do you have a little bit of background? Yeah, I can certainly Thank make you. mad if she'd like, but I, I can try responding. Uh, Ruthie, we uh, previously did do some contracting with member districts. For example, our um, Bremer facility is in the um, Osseo School District, and we first purchased that building for a number of years. We did contract for them. Ultimately, uh, they felt it wasn't worth their while, again, because of the limited numbers. Uh, so we tried that model, uh, but I think uh, May's explanation really is something that uh, we've just seen to be our reality, which is um, low student numbers, but still the need to, pro to provide a high quality healthy, um, appealing kind of, of food service. And it's a factor of our size and the kind of options we have for food service. Is that helpful? Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments regarding the liability and workers' compensation insurance renewal? <laughs> All right, Crystal, would you please call the roll? Adams. Aye. Bracky is an aye. Casey. Aye. Keen. Yes. Dallas. Yes. Douglas. Yes. Koontz. Aye. Marty. Yes. Neville. Yes. Sant. Yes. Seidel. Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. May, thank you for all of your work on, on those items. We're going to move on to the board business report on the agenda, number nine. First up is the policy review and revision. This is an information item. Um, Anne, would you like to give a little bit of background on the policy? Sure. Um, we, we have significant, as, as you saw, we have significantly expanded certain policies to include a lot more information that's actually in the statutes, but it's information that would be helpful for people who are looking up these topics to know. And so I have added some statutory information, for example, 
um, making sure that we've listed all the types of personnel data that are public and added a lot of information to the student data privacy rights and access policy so that parents would have not a one-stop shop because um, thinking of you, I, I did cut that policy in half. Actually, half of it is in a procedure. So it was much longer to begin with, if you can believe that. Um, but in those two areas, parents will be able to easily find all of the information that they would want to know about our student data privacy. So the, the night is young. If you'd like me to read them word for word, I certainly can. <laughs> um, but I, I wouldn't want to take away the advantage of having it all shared with us in advance so that we can <laughs> read that. So in the spirit of a flipped classroom, I will um, guess that we have had that opportunity to review it. But maybe if there are any questions that people have about the policy, this is a great time to bring them up. Uh, let's oh, see. Go ahead, I should Anna. mention, sorry, Madam Chair, there is one change um, in the student data privacy policy on page five, section five, A7, the word website after districts was crossed out accidentally. So in, when you get the okay. second read version, it'll say districts website. Thank you. That is helpful. Uh, that That is a good catch. I don't know if that was on our minds to ask, but thank you for bringing it up. And just for policy, I don't know if we've had the chance to review a lot of policy in this particular calendar year. So it, our process may be new for a couple, uh, for some of us, but this is our first read. So this is the opportunity for comments and questions, and then those can be incorporated into the policy before we are asked to approve it at a future board meeting. So we have a couple of people with questions and comments. We'll have Andrea Keen first, followed by Sam Sant. Andrea, go ahead, please. Yeah, and um, just more of a comment. As I was um, reading through the policies and I noticed so many changes and additions, I really was wondering why, if there had been a lot of changes in the statutes. So I really appreciate your explanation. And I want to let you know that in reading it, I, I thought the information was really clear and helpful. So thank you. I'm guessing that was a lot of work and um, I just appreciate that. Thank you. Well, thank you. I do have a confession. Um, we normally develop policies without reference to the MSBA policy, partly because the MSBA policies are so long mm -hmm. um, and because our district is unique. But in this case, in order to provide all of the information that I thought would be helpful to those looking for it, I did reference the MSBA policies. Great, thank you. Thank you. Sam. My question is regarding, I think it's the, the second uh, attachment, the DRP 120 personal data privacy. It's a six page document. Okay. And on the fifth page, uh, I'm curious as to, uh, uh, Roman rule eight is crossed out. And then at the bottom, it has responsible authority, um, citing the uh, superintendent Lewandowski, um, blah, 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 address, responsible, responsible authority with overall responsibility for the maintenance and security of personal data. I'm curious to know, uh, why is this language put into this document and not the other ones? Um, it's, it's not in the student data privacy policy. I believe it's it says it, DRP 120 personal data privacy. Right, right. I do believe the responsible authority is uh, referenced in either the student data privacy policy and or the public um, access policy. But then what, why is it stating the superintendent for responsible authority only? Um, because that's, we're required under statute to appoint a responsible authority for the district and to identify that person. Okay. And uh, often that person is the superintendent and often the superintendent delegates the, the actual compliance with a policy and the actual compliance with the data requests to another person in the administration. Okay. Then my, then my other question then too is, I understand that with the superintendent, then my other question is, why is it stating uh, Superintendent Lewandowski, um, you know, being that um, in the future, whatever endeavors, anything, 
if superintendent was to change, then does it have to be changed again with a, a new name? Or could it just state the superintendent of uh, Intermediate District 27? Does it specifically have to give the name of the superintendent? It doesn't. And in fact, we didn't before for that very reason. So as not to have to change the policy, it was recommended that we actually name the people who filled the roles. In other words, give their proper names uh, to make it easier to contact them. But I certainly could take them out and just refer to the responsible authority and the, um, the delegation to the general counsel. I could take our names out for sure. Um, and if I could make a, a recommendation to consider in light of that, because I understand that with policy, it is a, uh, as it should be a more complex process for review and renewal, but the procedural guide that can accompany it or possibly an appendix would not be subject to the same approval, but could serve for giving the community the information that they need. So maybe that would be the place where we could identify the specific person, in this case, Sandy Lewandowski, and then maybe the the policy just maintains the position. Excellent. Thanks, Sam. Did you have any other questions or comments? No, thank you. Okay, thank you. Heather Douglas. Thank you. Um, Sam, I was gonna ask uh, the same question, so thanks for getting that out there. Um, my other question though is about um, ease of access. When people are requesting information, do we um, have this information linked to um, the procedure and the policy linked together so they can see both, but also is there a specific form that's just on the website that can be used um, or printed out for people to receive information, especially pertaining to themselves? Because um, all I could see is that it, it said a written request, but um, the requirements of that written request aren't spelled out in the policy. I would assume that they're in the procedure, um, but I didn't see that there. And so um, I guess is, is there a form letter or something that we have that can be linked to that so that people have uh, easier access? Uh, I certainly can. We do in the public data requests uh, policy, there is a, a list of what kind of information should be included in a written request. It's on the first page. Uh, we don't have a specific form. We've allowed people to just ask by email if they so choose, but we certainly could create a form which they could use or not use at their option. Sure. I didn't see um, in the student one to request information about a student. I did not see, um, it just says to request, you know, that you can request it. It doesn't say anything else. Right. That information is all included in the, the public data access policy or okay. sorry, public data requests policy. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Are there any additional questions or comments regarding the two buckets of the two policies that are before us, multiple policies that are before us this evening. Thank you very much. These will come back for a second read and um, before we have the opportunity to approve them. So thank you, Anne, for all the work. It's good background. Um, it's helpful to have this first read. Thank you. You're welcome. Next, we will move on to board reports and the chair report. First item up is annual organizational memberships and the list is of, our, of our organizations that we will be renewing is included in the board packet um, with the Association of Educational Services Agencies and followed by AMSD, um, ECSU, the Educational Cooperative Services Unit, MSBA, MASA, the Minnesota Association of School Administrators, and NSBA, the National School Boards Association. This is an action item. Is there a motion to bring it to the table? So moved. Moved by Sam. Is there a second? I'll second Andrea Keen. Seconded by Andrea. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments regarding these membership renewals? Hearing none. 
Um, why don't we move forward for the roll call? Crystal. Adams. Aye. Bracky is an aye. Casey. Aye. Keen. Yes. Dallas. Yes. Douglas. Yes. Coons. See Michelle trying to get off mute. I'll come back to her. Marty. Yes. Neville. Yes. Sam. Yes. Seidel. Yes. And Michelle, I see you're off mute. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Thank That's all right. Thank you very much. The motion carries. Next up on the agenda is the summary of the superintendent evaluation. Uh, included in the packets is a letter summarizing our closed session on May 14th, and I'll just provide a verbal summary of that um, closed session. On Thursday, May 14th, the School Board of Intermediate District 287 went into closed session pursuant to Minnesota Statute Section 13 <laughs> Point zero five subdivision 3A to evaluate the performance of the superintendent. The evaluation was for the period of July 1, 2019 through May 14th of 2020 and was based on board members' input into seven overarching questions in order to provide feedback to Superintendent Lewandowski relative to her work performance on behalf of Intermediate District 287. Uh, go through the summary of some of the talking points that were shared by board members during this discussion. And as I mentioned, there were seven guiding questions. Number one, what do you think has gone well and or is worthy of praise? Comments included that Superintendent Lewandowski, Lewandowski is consistently responsive to the needs of students. The board appreciates her depth of knowledge and commitment to students. Her leadership in response to the COVID-19 crisis was exceptional. Her guidance of the district to become a trauma-sensitive and healing organization is the right move for our students. The next question asks, in the context of the district's mission, vision, and values, what are the superintendent's key strengths? The discussion comments included that Superintendent Lewandowski sets appropriately high standards and guides the process to achieve these goals. She is an advocate for our students and the district. She is inclusive in efforts to develop staff. And she is recognized for the development of her personal racial consciousness. Question three, what do you think is worthy of improvement? Board comments included a board member request that the board receive information with as much advance notice as possible in order to understand background that may require an emergency update. Concern was expressed regarding staff turnover with a request to learn more about how we can improve the hiring process. And Superintendent Lewandowski was asked to continue to develop leaders of color and work to make the district a safe place for students and staff of color. Question number four of the evaluation asks, in the context of the district's mission, vision, and values, are there any attributes that left unattended could inhibit the superintendent's long-term effectiveness? The board noted that addressing racial equity and the impact of trauma will continue to remain critical to students and staff. Concern was expressed by one board member about promoting leadership positions from within the district. And Superintendent Lewandowski was asked to keep the lines of communication open in evaluating the outcomes of distance learning. Question five is, are your expectations being met in terms of timing and quality? Comments included praise for the superintendent's mindfulness of sharing important information in a timely manner. An additional comment is that this area was met and exceeded. One member commented that our times when it feels like the board finds out about issues, quote unquote, on the back end. Item six, do you have any specific coaching you would like to pass on? A board member requested that information be gathered from those who deal directly with children. Also multiple board members encouraged the superintendent to take the time needed to prioritize her own health and well-being. Question seven, the final question on the questionnaire, 
Do you have any comments beyond your responses to questions one through six? Superintendent Lewandowski was thanked for her leadership and additional specific comments included, I definitely trust in her as our superintendent. I am grateful that 287 has Sandy's leadership during this very tumultuous past year. And she is a true rock and will fight to improve the lives of those who are the neediest among us. So that concludes the summary of the superintendent evaluation. Um, are there any board members who would like to add any comments? And I would invite Superintendent Lewandowski to share any comments that you may have. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. Um, I appreciate all the comments, um, the feedback um, and the encouragement. It, it uh, continues to be uh, just an amazing place to work um, with the students we serve and uh, the colleagues um, from all over the district. I can continue to be learning every single day uh, but it, it truly is um, a passion, um, and I feel privileged to be able to work on, on that passion. Uh, the last few months, um, especially the last two weeks, I think, have really brought that out, that we're doing the right work um, that's needed to be done. Uh, but it is very challenging work, and we need to continue to change and look inward um, at what needs to be changed over all parts of the district. Uh, but I, I truly do continue to feel it's the best job um, one could have, and I'm grateful for the opportunity, and I plan to take tomorrow off. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. Take care of yourself. <laughs> Will do. Will do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, we will move on to review of board communication guidelines. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. So uh, just this is an opportunity just to take a look at our communication guidelines. We've had a lot of change this spring with the move to the virtual board meetings and distance learning. Um, and let's see, I would ask, I know that Superintendent Lewandowski and Ann Becker, you had a lot of input for this. Is there anyone, either of you who would like to present this or I can kind of talk through it? I, if you would go ahead, that'd be great. I will just step through it. Thank you. So first off, and so what I'd like, this is just a, a guideline. It's a draft, as it says at the top, and it's helpful as a board to just step through what is workable for our group as we continue to move forward. And again, as I introduced, we've had a lot of change with a moving to the virtual meeting format. So we just want to take a moment to pause and make sure that needs are being met. So first, in terms of audience opportunity to speak, um, at the beginning of our virtual meeting process, we were accepting emails until a half hour before the board meeting. And upon reflection, it was realized that we're doing quite a lot up until a half hour before the board meeting. And one, there's a risk of missing an email that may come in because we're so focused on getting the meeting started. And two, we want to have the person reading the reading the comment to have the opportunity to prepare. And if there's any private data included in the email, there needs to be an opportunity to protect that data with redaction. So the suggestion is that this, and what's already been updated on the website is moving to a cutoff time of 4.30 on the day of the board meeting. Uh, does anyone have questions or comments related to that item? And I have this up in view. I don't know if I can see a raised hand without scooting out of this. So I'm just going to continue forward. Uh, but please do make a you know shout out if you have a question or comment. The second item, how does someone contact the 287 board? In the past, in my experience with the board, we have not had a lot of email. I'm trying to remember much of any email over the past eight years or so that I've been with the district. But we have had email recently. And I know each district has their own protocol for addressing board email, and there's quite a range from my own experience in how different districts address this issue. So given that we haven't had an opportunity to address a protocol with our group, with our current board, I think this is a good opportunity to do so. 
Uh, one, what's posted on our website is our board address, board at district287.org. And when an email is sent to that address, Juanin sends that email on to the full board, or if it's only a question for an individual or small group of board members, it would be forwarded on accordingly. And then as a response, the right now, what we have been doing up until this time is I've been responding as chair on behalf of the board, acknowledging receipt and thanking the sender for input, but not going farther into specifically addressing anything in the email. And the one, we haven't had a request for anything that would require more specific response, but the intention is that if there is more specific information sought, in general, that would be a management role to be passed on to the appropriate staff member. But again, I know that districts manage this particular issue of email very differently. If anyone has a recommendation that we pursue something different, um, let me know. Heather. Heather and then Crystal. Yes. So um, I agree with that, but I would also add that um, in District 279, what we do is, generally speaking, we have the board chair make a response first. And then if individual board members have something they would like to add or share, or at least maybe just acknowledge the email, um, that that message come out after the board chair email has come out. Um, that way there isn't um, a you know, like misinformation or um, a disconnect between information being shared or um, response to that person. So like, for example, if someone asked for a data request um, that the board chair would say, you know, thank you for receiving, you know, we've received your message, blah, blah, blah. This is how you can do that. Or this is where I would direct you to do that. Um, that if any of us has the need to respond that that it is after that versus okay. um, before that. Thank you. And then Crystal. Yeah, I just wanted to share what is my personal and potentially dissenting opinion on this, um, which is I would prefer to have um, my direct contact information available on our public website. Um, and, and it's in part because I think that that's part of our responsibility as public board members is to be available and accessible for people who want to reach us, whatever the reasons might be. Um, and I'm also concerned about um, a potential perception that people might feel as though they're not allowed to contact us directly and have to go through others to do so. Um, and I, I think um, in doing a very quick scan, I think all of our member districts and all of the other intermediate districts have individual board member contact information on their website. And so it also concerns me that we are um, doing something that is quite a bit different from what the, the traditional practice from all of our community seems to be. I can add just a little update in reference to Adina. We changed our practice uh, about two years ago. Um, we used, I was clerk for Adina for several years and responded on behalf of the board with quite a lot of information. Um, that was vetted through the district just to make sure it was accurate and responded to questions uh, that the volume became overwhelming because we were receiving hundreds of emails in any particular week. The second part of that is, uh, we, they, so the district has stopped doing that. Um, now there is just simply an acknowledgement of receipt and thanking members for, or thanking people for sending the email. The second, thing that changed two years ago is that individual board addresses were taken off of the Adina site. Uh, there were individual board members who received death threats after it just, there was a significant, a lot of difficult work around equity and around just um, ideological differences within the community. So it was moved, it was changed for safety reasons. So I know that that is Adina's practice, which is new within the last two years. Um, but it is possible that the rest of the districts do still have individual 
addresses up. Heather. Um, could I just add um, that I, uh, I think I have a unique perspective on, on the things that both you and Crystal have just shared. Um, so I agree that we should have our individual email addresses out there and people should be able to contact us directly as individual board members, especially if you think about the diversity of our students, um, they may want the parents or family members or people within the community may want to reach out to um, board members who are like if their student is normally an Adina student, they might want to contact you personally um, versus the whole board. But I think that um, I guess what I was referring to is the if we get an email that's to the entire board, that it be responded to by the board chair and then the rest of us can follow up with our own response if we choose. But I think that we need to have our information out there. Like Crystal said, we are elected officials and we're here to serve. Um, and I also have received death threats on my school board and my information is out there, but I still feel very strongly that it's my responsibility to receive that information, especially if somebody feels like they are not being heard by other board members or the board as a whole. Um, that, but as a board member, when I receive personal emails on my regular school board, I always check in with my superintendent to find out, you know, was this sent to multiple board members individually? Was this just sent to me? How are we following up on this? Um, and having that really open communication, I think is really important um, because ultimately I'm not gonna solve the problem on my own, but I think that if someone reaches out to me personally, that it's my responsibility to respond back to them personally, if that makes sense. So I guess that's my take on it. Thank you. And uh, we are going to go to Andrea next. And just to clarify, I recognize that our individual addresses are not on the website right now, but this suggestion is not to take the place of correspondence that comes to any of us individually. Because when someone contacts us individually, that would be between the individual board member and the, the person who contacts them. But thank you. Andrea. Yeah, I just wanted to make a, a quick comment that um, I'm kind of embarrassed to admit that I didn't even realize that our individual um, email addresses weren't on the 287 website. I guess I haven't looked at that carefully, but I certainly would be in favor of adding those individual emails um, if that's something we're thinking of doing. Um, that's it. Thank you. Uh, any other comments or thoughts regarding item number two? Ann. I just want to echo that um, I'm supportive of putting our emails on the website. And I was one of the people, I'm not sure what happened. There was an email that came to a bunch of board members and, and they said, well, I, we found a bunch of board members' emails, but there were a few that we couldn't find, and I was one of those few, and I felt a little weird about that. Like, uh, if, if people are available, and I don't know how they were available, whether it was because they were in the staff directory or whatever, and then others were not, I think that that made me feel a little uncomfortable. So I, at that point, I didn't know, like Andrea, I didn't know whether they were or weren't. I was like, is mine not on the district website, but everyone else's is? So I looked, and I saw that... None of them were so I, but I would absolutely be um, supportive of of having my email address published on the on the district website. Thank you. That's helpful background. And any other comments on number two? Okay, I do appreciate I, I do, Regina. that. I can't. Oh, Regina, sorry. I, I I do, Sam. Oh, Sam, yes, go I was ahead. Sorry, your your video is frozen for some reason, so I'm not able to see a wave, but thank you, go ahead. I was gonna say, did you see my hand raised in the board book too, or? Oh, I can't do both simultaneously. So um, I can, and yes, I, as I minimize the communication, I can see your hand raised, so thank you. Does everybody have a way to view the discussion points that are up? Because if so, I can keep it minimized and then I can see the raised hands. So I'm gonna continue with that. Sam, go ahead, please. I was also gonna say that I, I support uh, having our emails uh, on the website listed, just because you know, for transparency, for anyone to get a hold of us as board members, 
uh, like Heather said, we are uh, public officials and uh, if someone wants to reach out to us, you know, they very well should be able to and for us to answer if we can or uh, discuss with the superintendent and the rest of the board first. Excellent, thank you. And any other comments on number two? Sandy, go ahead, please. I just um, uh, certainly honor that request and, and this is a good um, relook at things that have been done a certain way for a period of time. So I appreciate the input and we certainly can change that uh, really easily actually. What I would ask is that each board member be sure that Juanine has your preferred email address to put up there. Um, I know you probably get um, uh, involved in two, three email addresses. So just, we, just make sure you have the preferred one uh, to Juanine to list, that would be helpful. Um, and, and I see Heather has a question. I, my comment with that, I appreciate that. And it kind of leads to another one of our talking points coming up. But given that this is in the context of District 287, I'd like to maintain some clarity that uh, even though, yes, we are never ceasing to represent our home district, the context in which we would receive an email from that site, I'd like to maintain some clarity that it is District 287. But I, Sandy, I appreciate your comment. It's completely relevant. And we're going to touch on that in just a moment. Heather, you had another question? Well, I was just going to echo kind of what you said that I actually think that it should be our 287 email address. But would it be possible to um, say, you know, school board director, John Smith, this is their email address, this is the district, their home district, and this is their home district email address, just to do both or skip the home email address and just do the 287, but to share what district we represent. Thank you. The, the home district we represent is, I believe, already on the website. I will double check that. Um, yeah. And I appreciate your suggestion about having both addresses there. Um, I, let's just think about that one and see what seems to make the most sense. Madam Chair, this is, yes. this is Chad. Thank I, you. I just wanted to in, uh, let you all know that um, all of the board member um, information, your contact information with your district address is in the staff directory on our website. Our individual addresses? Yes. Oh, thank you. That's been updated. So we're, wow, you guys are good. Thank you. So yes, and we will, um, you know, obviously heed your your advice um, in terms of adding it to the board member um, page. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And this is why we're taking the opportunity to do this. We have not had this discussion for a while, but also we have had minimal communication. So we just wanna make sure that we are clear, particularly with our current board. So thank you, Chad, I appreciate that. Uh, are we ready to move on to the item number three or does anyone have additional questions or comments on number two? And this is informational, we can return to this. You can uh, just send comments to me after the meeting as you reflect on it. But how does someone, uh, what should I do if I'm contacted by a staff member? And general protocol is we should direct the questions or concerns to the superintendent. Any questions or comments regarding that protocol? Okay, thank you. And then number four, sure. who do I contact? Uh, Ruthie has a question. Oh, Ruthie, go ahead, please. Ruthie, do you have a question or comment? Oh, I think you're muted, Ruthie. Okay. I was just wondering if the staff concern is regarding the superintendent, then who should it go to? Maybe the board chair or, or who should it be? My recommendation is the board chair. Um, it would be the board chair in the case of the superintendent alone, because that is the only individual whom we supervise. 
Right. Is that helpful? Yeah. Okay. And um, any but, other questions or comments? Go ahead. But when it says who should who should I contact by if I have a contact by a staff member, uh, who should they contact? And we send it to the superintendent. And you're saying if it's regarding the superintendent, then it goes to the board chair. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Thank you. Should it be put there in the in the statement or add the oh, I think we can make that amendment absolutely. to the question. And that particular item may already be referenced in policy. So um, we're not necessarily addressing policy, but it may be helpful here as well. So thank you. I'm gonna make that note down just so I have it. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, questions about the board packet. Who do I contact if I have questions about the board packet? So um, certainly start with the board chair with questions about the packet. Um, I think it, this group has been doing a really good job of coming to meetings prepared and reading through it in advance. Um, the questions would be directed to the appropriate department member who could best an answer it and address it. Um, if there's questions, it can also be helpful to just raise those in advance of a board meeting, which again, I think that our group is really good about doing. But if there's something you intend to ask about during the meeting, the heads up is nice for the staff to know, oh, there's going to be some questions for clarification about whatever the item is then it gives an opportunity to have that information ready to go for a board meeting. Um, but I will give kudos to our lead team. They are really quick with looking things up. I, I would prefer to give people as much advance notice as possible so that our questions can be addressed um, with as much thoroughness as needed. Are there any questions regarding number four and the board packet? Excellent. So, oh, how often should I check my 287 emails? Regularly, every day. I, I would say a lot to check them. Uh, but here's my own, I'm going to just share my own learning process on this, which is partly why I wanted to bring it up here. Uh, like a lot of people, I have multiple email addresses. Um, even though it seems like I use one the most and that's just kind of the way it is or I separate, you know, I have my work email address and then my personal. Um, the reality is that my work email address is divided in more than one compartment, 287 being one of them. So there are good reasons to have our independent 287 address. Part of it is for uh, making sure that that information stays separate and doesn't get mixed up or confused, per particularly with any of our personal information. That's certainly the MSBA recommendation is that all of that information be kept separate. But it can make a challenge for checking it. And what I realized this spring is that my 287 address had changed since I joined 287. And it was just, it was a slight, uh, we're at 287.org, I believe right now. I tend to forget what it is, but I got so used to it but also Juanine is just that good. So Juanine, this is a big shout out because what I realized you were doing, and I think you still do this, and I'm so grateful. You include multiple addresses for me when you send information. So it yeah. has been seamless. I'm really grateful for that. But when I realized that I was no longer getting 287 information, uh, that's that was my obligation and responsibility to fix it. The tech team was amazing. We figured out what it was. I also figured out that the original passwords I set up had things had shifted. So I had to re-enter them. It was a great opportunity to, for a refresh. Um, and I'm now back in the game and checking it regularly. What I don't want to hold up is any work that the district needs to do through the board. So if um I don't want wanting to have to try to reach out to call me or email me multiple times to get a hold of me because that's holding up the business of the district. So one, uh, if you're not sure if your 287 email is easily accessible, I would encourage you to um, 
maybe just start with me so we can kind of get a sense of how large a scope this is. I am sure I will not be able to solve that issue, but we'll find the right tech team to make sure that we can take care of it. Any questions or comments on the 287 email? Andrea. Regina, thanks. I just wanted to say the exact same thing happened to me. I'm not sure why, but it must have been the same thing. And so it, it was a little bit of a bump um, and it takes some getting used to. But if you're having trouble, the tech team can get you set up and fixed. And so if you realize you're not getting your, it, it took me a while to realize I wasn't getting my 287 email. And so, um, yeah, just pay attention. And if you figure it out, then they'll be able to help you and, and set it back up. So. So make sure that somehow you have it set up in a place where you can see and check what's incoming from 287 every day. Uh, that is just our job as board members to make sure that we're staying in the loop. But we also want to make it, it accessible so it's possible to stay in the loop. Any other questions on number five with 287 email? See if there's any raised hands. All right. Quorum. Oh, this is just a quick thing because I think people are really good, but it's just a helpful reminder. We need a quorum. So this is a perfect day to talk about it. We're all here. We all have 100%. So that is fantastic. Things come up. We get it. If you're not able to make a meeting, please connect with me or with Juanin to let us know. Um, as soon as you know is really helpful, but we also realize that sometimes things come up day up that are beyond our control. It happens. Let us know. And um, there have been a couple times where we weren't sure if we were going to have a quorum up until meeting time. So we just want to make sure that that moves as smoothly as possible. Any questions about quorum? OK. And then finally, logging in. Um, this I'm learning a lot about all kinds of virtual meeting platforms. And as soon as I learn something, it does change. And I've updated my Zoom account. And I'm updated the extensions for Google Meet. And then I changed to something else and I can't get in and I constantly forget to unmute myself. So that this is a learning curve, but I'm considering it very healthy to continue on that learning curve. Um, I'd say again, tonight, we're all getting A's. Here we are and it's working out. But that I just can't say enough positive things about the tech staff at 287 and their willingness to help us figure out whatever it is that we need to log on for a board meeting. Are there any issues anyone's having that we should add to this particular item or is that good on its own? Andrea. Just for the record, I'd like to say, I'm still feeling a little discombobulated by board book premiere. So, um, Juanine, I appreciate it that you still let us look at it in classic if we want to, because why that isn't letting me do that. Okay. okay. So maybe <laughs> you could show me how. <laughs> but anyway, it's it's kind of not very intuitive. And saying that, I think I've just frozen something on what are all of you seeing? Oh no, I got I went out of it completely. I'll come back. Um it was and it was going so smoothly, but all right, I'm back. Um, so that can that concludes the informational item, but we have not had that opportunity to work through some of those issues as a board. So thank you very much for um, the comments. And if you think of things as you reflect on it, please let me know. This is not an action item, but it's just to help us get a little tune up. Any other questions or comments on this item before we move on? Sandy. I just uh, wonder if you can clarify um, uh, what I understand we, we want to change at this point based on this conversation is that we will put um, every board member's name, the member district uh, that they represent and their um, email address that would reach them directly. Um, and that would be in addition to the directory information. That's what I heard. Is that correct? Okay, good. I just want to make sure. Right. That is what I heard and um, to further clarify that it will be our individual 287 address, yeah. but the home district that we represent. So thank you. So yeah, thank you all. I appreciate allowing a little bit of time to step through that. Um, next up, AMSD report. Andrea, 
What can you share? Thanks, Regina. Um, well, the AMSD board meetings are done for the year. Um, I'm guessing you've all heard that there will be a special session tomorrow. Um, so uh, I think the only other thing I wanted to remind you about is that next Wednesday, June 17th, we're having a Reimagine Minnesota um, event specifically designed for school board members. Um, and it's not too late to register and there is no fee, it's free. Um, so if you're interested, just go to the AMSD website to register next Wednesday, 9 to 12. And um, the keynote speaker has been confirmed. It will be Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan. Um, and I think it will be a really great morning for people who have been really plugged into Reimagine Minnesota, as well as people who maybe want to learn more about what it is and how it was created and how we can use it to move forward. So I really encourage everyone to um, remind your board members and hope to see everyone there. Thank you. I just registered today and was reminded when I registered, the deadline is tomorrow. So well, if it's really not, but that's it's real. Oh, that's just to get people to register. We really. know you. We can <laughs> register we know the people. Thank you. Thank God. <laughs> Me to register. I looked at it, but I'm not putting this off anymore. Yeah, it worked. But thank you. It did. It did. It's very effective. Good. Uh, any other AMSD comments? <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. And um, <clears throat> district news. So we just have our basic planning calendar. Um, Board events. We will meet again on June 25th. Once around the table, graduations. I'm guessing that districts are on the other side of graduations. I can just speak. I want to just share from Adina. We had um, seven Adina grads on my circle. It's a neighborhood that just houses keep filling up with kids, and then those kids keep growing up. Um, but we had a parade. We all wore green and white and had noisemakers and chimes and we and we had masks and we social distanced, but we followed that bus and we went to all the houses to cheer on each individual student as they received their diploma in front of their houses. So it was um, something that at least the feedback in my neighborhood was we're probably going to try to keep some version of this. Everybody. Oh. Everybody really appreciated it. But any other ones around the table items any of you would like to share? Andrea and then Michelle. I'll just quick share because it's recent. Um, we had been holding out for August 1st at Mariucci at the University of Minnesota. And today was the day that the University of Minnesota contacted us and said they will not be allowing any gatherings until probably the end of September. So just during this meeting, um, the email went out from our uh, high school principal to all the parents. So if you saw me looking down at my phone, it was because I was getting all these emails from all the moms and were saying, what, why not? What are we doing instead? Oh my gosh. So today was the day we got that news and now we are going to move forward with planning something. I hope kind of similar to what it looked like Richfield did, Crystal. So I might have to call you later to get all the details. We don't know. Okay, Michelle. Well, I just wanted to show my appreciation or express my appreciation for the 287 graduation ceremonies. I spent the better part of the whole day. I, I didn't have to drive anywhere, so I could just stay put and say, oh, now I'm here and now I'm there. You know, but um, I think uh, under the circumstances, they were as good as ever. And the kids were all excited, and I I love the backstories. Those did not, those were not missing. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to thank everybody involved, um, and let's hope we can keep. <laughs> maybe we'll take the best of what happened this year and put it into next year and have improvements. But. Um, as far as the kids were concerned, I was really happy to get to know them a little bit on the videos. So kudos to everyone who was in charge of that. I thought it was a great job. Thank you. Well said, I agree. Um, any additional comments? I do not see any raised hands. Oh, 
Oh, Ruthie. I don't know Go why ahead. my raised hand is not showing, but I don't, um, I don't know. But anyway, we'll figure it out. Just want to say kudos to um, Brooklyn Center. Our school district did a great job in putting together a really wonderful video, and I think you can find it on our website. Um, but it honored all the graduates virtually. You know, had guest speakers and principal talking. It's really good video. So very proud of it. Excellent. And anybody else? All right. Is there, it's still light outside. I think we have another 45 minutes in Minnesota for June sunlight. <laughs> Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved, Michelle Kuntz. Moved by Michelle. Second, Steve Adams. Seconded by Steve. All those in favor, Crystal, please call the roll. Adams. Aye. Bracky is an aye. Casey. Aye. Keen. Yes. Dallas. Yes. Douglas. Yes. Kuntz. Aye. Marty. Yes. Neville. Yes. Sam. Yes. Seidel. Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Um, with that, we are adjourned. Have a great evening, everyone. See you in a couple weeks. Right. Thank you, everybody. Bye. You too. Bye bye. 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 So, Green Mill.